Do not study facts in isolation. Do, please do not study facts in isolation. Do not remember facts in isolation. This is not how you become good at history or your humanities class if you don't make connections. Don't waste your time. You know, it's always that, that I know that euphemistic phrase like, you know, um, work smarter, not harder, but it applies to history so much, especially for your A push test. I, you can see me just almost pleading and begging with you that do not study facts in isolation. Well, Mr. Price, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean that, you know, you say, oh, the Stamp Act in 1765 was more of an internal tax than indirect tax. You know, affecting the colonists. Uh, doesn't mean that the Arkansas Confederation set up a weak national government and they could not control trade in the states. The Missouri Compromise was when Missouri came in as a free state, Missouri came in as a slave state, and Maine came in as a free state. Does not mean anything that you're recalling those. It's good that you kind of know something about it, but you're going to have to make the connections all the time in here. Here's the thing is, and you're going to say, and it, that's why they have these kind of like, you know, AP history thinking skills here. Just change. No, change over time. Why is it after the French and Indian War, we were all so proud as colonists going like, you know, GBA, Great Britain of America, GBA, GBA, GBA. And then all of a sudden we're like, hey, we want our own independence. What does that change from there? If you want to like, you know, compare what are the effects of like the common sense in, um, you know, uh, 1776 to Uncle Tom's cabinet, in 1852, how did those affect, you know, um, society and have an impact on society to make a kind of like, you know, radical change or to kind of perpetuate this independence movement and the abolitionist movement, you know, leading towards the Civil War. You have to always be thinking if you're studying something, you're studying a dance, well, how did it compare to some other act like the T Act or something. So you're always doing these things here. Uh, you, the KKK reconstruction that we just talked about in my last video, or uh, yes, yeah, the video before, uh, the reconstruction in there to compare to what we're gonna do in period seven, the KKK of the 1920s. Context, why, why if you're studying We Audit, you know, uh, the women's movement, you know, suffrage there, the, you know, again, the abolitionist movement, you know, all, all this, time, you know, in there, the utopian movement. Why at that time? Why at that time? You have to ask yourself why at that time. And you start thinking, oh, Second Great Awakening. There's like, you know, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson and the, you know, really the transcendentalist. Jacksonian democracy is going on. You have to bring context in that. You have to make connections to all these things here. The kind of change over time of, you know, why is it that civil rights kind of start, you know, really being suppressed after Reconstruction? Well, you had the Supreme Court going against all the, like, you know, civil rights legislation from the federal government. You had the South redeeming itself. So putting themselves in power and putting in laws that disenfranchise African Americans. So it really was a big struggle for civil rights at that time. Change in continuity, women's movement from 1848, declaration of like sentiments there. So, and you know, you get ASA and NASA, like, you know, the American Women's Association and then the, the um, you know, National Women's Association. Why did they split? And then why did they like, you know, come back together by the early 20th century? You need to know that. Uh, compare War of 1812 to World War One. there's a lot of things that, comparison usually implies always like similarities. Contrasting what we're going to get today, the market revolution or the first industrial revolution in the United States to the Gilded Age of the second industrial revolution. What were some of the differences that was here in there? So you should, uh, again, that's always, you're never studying in isolation. Um, comparing and contrasting the captains of industry 
versus robber barons. Why were some like, you know, why did they view some of the captains of industry in here versus like, you know, robber barons? And speaking of this, when I'm going to kind of to lead off from that, from the Gilded Age and what you need to know, when you hear this music, you know you're talking about the big four men who built America. And you have an argument, they are the poster um, children of, you know, captains of industry versus robber barons. You have Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Commodore from Gibbons versus Ogden. You know, he was, the reason why they call him a Commodore because he got, that's where his money's in shipping. But he really made his millions and skillions in the railroad industry and, and kind of dominate the railroad lines, the area line, the New York line. You have Mr. Carnegie starting off with Tom Scott and the railroads, then he got into iron, then he got into steel, and you know him that he started dominating other industries that would make his industry more efficient, what we call vertical integration. So you know and, and he used the Bessemer process. It to dominate and kind of produce, I told you, from virtually, you know, the U.S. not producing any steel in the 1850s, becoming the leading steel exporter and producer by the 20th century. It's amazing. And you know you got the big dog, you know, like that. You know you got, a, you got John Rockefeller, you know. And I've always said that it's for you guys to get, <laughs> you set yourself apart from your peers, it's not old. It's oil refinery. Anybody, you can be, anybody can be uh, Drake and, you know, and, and, you know, drilling for oil, but what about refining oil? Putting it into something that's standard. Putting in something that, you know, again, that you can use. And he started early on with what we're kind of describing here, the horizontal integration that you would buy up your competitors starting out in Ohio and making sure you dominate the refinery, you know, business. Of course, he's going to go into his vertical integration, you know, the rail lines, the pipelines, all kinds of things. But he has known that initially in there and just making just this kind of multi skillionaire. And you got Jupiter Morgan. Yeah, that's his first name. J.P. Morgan. And he is the banker who kind of saves us in, you know, a couple of panics in our time from 1893, 1907. But if you want to know one thing, buying it, kind of like pulling off the, the terms of buying, um, you know, Carnegie Steel Company, $400 million, making it worth like the first billion dollar company, the United States Steel corporation here so he is the one of the big dogs too he is the ultimate baker really just saving the united states economy by being the national bank by being the federal reserve almost in a way in there i was jp morgan if you have to ask how much it costs then you know you can't afford it like that so you don't need to be you know all these kind of things that, that are kind of quoted to these to um you know, these captains of industry or some people viewpoint that they're just saying that, you know, they're robber barons. And that's what Mark Twain is saying here. Um, what is the price of getting rich? What is your, what is the chief end of man? Is it to get rich and how are you going to do that in an honest way? Or, you know, just be, or you're going to cheat your way when you can feel like you can get away with it. So, to put up here that you see the kind of like arguments and already here. You have to know a couple of these already going in here. I'm hoping you get a DBQ on the Gilded Age or something that you're familiar with because you know the argument. Are they captains of industry? They produce, you know, they have a positive thing. They expand the markets. They are efficient. They are innovative, producing all, you know, uh, again, that you can make things like Rockefeller is saying that like make things even like cheaper. You're making kerosene cheaper to the consumers. So they really have a positive impact. They are giving people opportunities, employment, jobs, social mobility. So you can become, if you, even if you think is delusional, that maybe you're not become... Carnegie or Rockefeller or James B. Duke, 
you know, or Gustavus Swift or whatever, but you're actually going to become mid-level management, a supervisor. You maybe you don't get to own a mansion like, you know, in New York City or something, but in, you know, upper Manhattan, but you're able to at least move into the middle class. And you know, another thing is they said the capital of industry, they are philanthropists. They, you know, the universities, you get the libraries, you get, you know, the University of Chicago, you get Spelman College, uh, Rockefeller's wife investing into this, donating money here. So they are not evil, bad, these basement kind of corporate people that's, you know, that's buying a, um, you know, a you know, a dinosaur or something like that, you know, <laughs> in Jurassic World or something, you know, and, and laugh with a maniacal laugh and everything. They are having a positive. That's that debate. Uh, some people see them using a middle age term. They're robber bears. They have a negative effect. They're taking the resources from, you know, that's abundant in America. They're doing all these things in here that in this country and just really in a kind of, you know, uh, get callous way in there. They are definitely bribing, they're influencing government people. I'm an average guy. Where is democracy for me? It only works for the rich people. It only works for their influence. They're not going to listen to me. I don't have money to bribe them. And I, again, this is time of open bribery and corruption here. That's what they're doing. They're actually taking advantage of workers. They're paying them such a low wage. The disparity, the income inequality of what the, you know, corporate owners are making or the kind of like, you know, uh, and the investments they make, the board of directors compared to the worker that's working like over really like, you know, the, the kind of time of day at this time is like 12 to 14 hours is really taking advantage. Of it. And then I told you, you become the, the safety measures, there's no OSHA, there's no kind of like federal regulations. You're really, you know, again, you're hiring child labor, you're hiring cheap labor, and they're in, you know, they're not, there's no mandatory breaks, there's no mandatory equipment that you have to wear, just, you know, that, you know, in order to, you know, those, uh, you know, the heat up the steel, work on the railroads. So they're really unsafe working conditions. These guys are exploitive. They are the ones that are really ha actually ruining America and they're not kept in check. So that's the debate that you have now. Again, what, what I, you see on the bottom here, you get this social Darwinist, you know, kind of side of the, the captains of industry. Well, you know, the, you know, the survival of the fittest in industry that you don't have to know these names like William Graham Sumner, Herbert Spencer, uh, Russell Conwell. I always want to call him Russell Crowe, <laughs> the gladiator. Um, you know, Horatio Alger side. Well, look, Carnegie is successful because he's superior stock, and it's good. And it's good that other businesses are kind of eliminated. And did I say that? That's one thing that's bad for what they want to the criticism is the elimination of competition, of the kind of you know, trust, pools, holding companies, that monopolistic competition, they're eliminating people, they're putting them out of business and they're dominating the industry here. So all you really need to remember, you don't need to, for May 15th test, you don't need to just think, well, Ms. Price, what's a pool, what's a holding company? And even almost trust, you just know it's monopolistic domination of the industry. They're dominating all, all over, all over their competitors, eliminating them, crushing them and kind of becoming the sole business owner, making again, you know, um, a lot of wealth, increasing their wealth, increasing the wealth of the people that's in the board of directors in this way. So yes, that social Darwinism and it's good that they are surviving and the cream rises to the crop. Versus people like Henry George, Edward Bellamy, Thorsten Veblen, the labor union kind of slash populist perspective on all that, that they are robber barons. They are running roughshod through us. And really they're not, you know, the social mobility has almost a plateau where you can go in certain, in some of these companies. And then at what risk and what are they doing? And anytime we want a fair shake, they're hiring goons, Pinkertons to break up the unions. 
Uh, they're hiring like, you know, uh, cheap labor to undercut, not to give people a fair living wage. Or, you know, there's no mention of minimum wage. We don't get that until the 1930s, <laughs> you know, again, to the uh, second new deal. All right. So that's a lot. But for most of you, it's just things that you already know. You know this kind of like, you know the big four, you maybe even, you know some others of what's going on here. Now, kind of to get started or restart here, how did we get here? What you should know, how did it start? And I have a mnemonic device, it's Tango, all right? So that is the mnemonic device here. And it is Tango. And just like a G I hate lamb, you don't need to know all of the tangle mnemonic device here. You say like, hmm, Gilded Age, how do we get there? I know rolls, because that's pretty easy anyway. Railroads, 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 oil, steel, and electricity. But Mr. Price is introducing Tangle here, thinking about like, well, what do we get here? Well, what we already know, just in patterns of war, there's always the bust and boom, bust and boom. War of 1812, you know, again, the bust and then the boom of America. You know, you get the bust and the boom. Really, after the Mexican-American War, there's a quicker boom with the, you know, California, you know, becoming a state by 1850 and, you know, finding the gold in 1848. Civil War, same thing in World War I, World War II, the recessions, depression, but then boom, and you are going to have, you know, one of the biggest booms here in the Gilded Age at this point. But, get to the tangle, Mr. Price. Yeah. Tank, t technology, technology, you know, from telephones, you know, again, 1876, you know, and, and it takes time for telephone. Really, there's always this lag time of technology about 10 to 20 years before it becomes really to consumers, but you see people really, you know, um, beginning to use this and you can see this coming from a typewriter to like a really a home sewing machine uh, to even air brakes for the industry I had mentioned before by Westinghouse, Edison, the Wizard of Menlo Park, you know, using, you know, his, you know, uh, his direct current and, you know, the, you know, a, cause like a light bulb that consumers can use. So technology is the same. A, agriculture base. <laughs> the kind of double-edged sort of agriculture. They're going to increase production. And you know that's going to be, and we're going to talk about this on Monday, is going to actually hurt them in a way by being so productive at this time. You got to, you know, since the advancements from the mid 19th century and more advancements at this time from the steel plow, from the uh, mechanical reapers that, you know, that's really making things more productive. Now you have an excess supply of workers. It's not subsistence farming anymore. Where are those workers going to go? Well, they're going to go to the factories, you know, whether it be mostly in the north and soon developing in the south, that's where they're going to go. So got agricultural base in there. So in, in this in this way. So and then you got the end, you got natural resources. So in copper, coal, timber, water. We are blessed to be on this side of the Atlantic with the abundance of natural resources that we have. Again, we even lead in really, we're the leader as far as oil and oil production export, all the way really to the 1970s really. So now I tell you right now about the abundance of natural resources that we have on here. So good. Uh, DG is funny. Government is going to be laissez-faire. All right, and they're going to be kind of let the you know unregulated. It reminds you of the twenties, reminds you a little bit of the eighties, kind of the you know trickle down. But it's funny when they do interfere, they seem to interfere on the part of business. What are they doing? They're creating high tariffs to protect the industry. You know, they're giving out land grants to railroad companies to kind of entice them, to, you know, to you know build. You know, they're giving government subsidy. It seems like there is government interference, but it's it's kind of a <laughs> it's kind of reverse socialism in a way, and that you know you're doing it for business. This 
kind of, and again, it just infuses a lot of this capital at this time here. So, all right, government business here. So, and then the labor supply, you know where most of the labor, it, it's, it's coming from the farm, it's coming overseas for the new immigrants. And we'll talk more about that on Monday. And that's always good for as you're spending business that, you know, the more profits you can make, the more money you can use for investment. And the last one is, are the risk takers, the entrepreneurs? Who are these people that's going to like, you know, hey, I'm going to create this this business here, whether you're a Remington, whether you're, again that you, you know, that you are a, you know, Gustavo Swift that's going to make a better refrigerated car. These risk takers are here investing in here to try to, you know, again, to build up an economy, take advantage of the opportunities at this time here. And most risk takers are going to fail. We only say the ones that really become really successful, but that's what's going on at this time. All right. Man, that's a good job. That's really good. Just soak that in, please. But there's reaction to the Gilded Age. And I did a lot of this on, um, you know, talking, doing and going over the DPQ example. It's the labor union time here. And I said here, pick one. Uh, I didn't put it up here. I think that the National Labor Union is one of the first ones. And then you got, of course, the All-Stars, um, Knights of Labor, Terrence Powderly. The AFL is forming really during that year, the Haymarket, um, you know, riot here in 1886. Skilled workers, uh, that's in there. The IWW, more of Mr. Price's commie socialist buddies who are very radical and revolutionary, more the 20th century. Uh, you got the, you know, American Railway Union, Eugene V. Debs here. So just pick one. I mean, just just know one. Uh, it wanted to leave, and I, I put the two biggest celebrity labor union leaders, Samuel Gompers, the good union, the AFL, the more the pure unionism, the bread and butter unionism, wages, shorter hours, you know, that's all they want. They don't really want to, like, you know, take over the government or own the companies themselves, you know, like some of the people in the IWW and even a nice labor kind of like stress at the time here. Uh, and Eugene Vitez, I mean, who's going to run for president, like, you know, uh, two to three times, I believe, here. And he's put in jail after the great, uh, um, not the great, the Pullman strike in uh, 1894. So, and, he, and, and he's going to stay in jail. And they, they put an injunction on him. Uh, pick one, uh, the, one of these strikes, railroad strike of, great railway strike of 1877. Uh, you know, that's the Baltimore and Cumberland lines. That's right there. Haymarket affair. Hey, that's not really a strike. It's more of a protest. And I put a homestead there with the, you know, Carnegie and Mr. Frick. And the Pullman strike of 1894 of his company towns. Vocabulary strikes. Big one, collective bargaining. Well, what is that? You bargain with in numbers instead of by yourself because you're more at risk to get fired or let go or replaced in there. Uh, yellow dog contract that, you know, that, you know, that really is, uh, they did not want to, like, you don't join a union in there and maybe I didn't put this in here like you know the clothes shop is only for union members and all this stuff is kind of like you know jargon that the unions are kind of you know working for or working against as far as like the yellow dog contract you know versus like what can businesses use the lockouts or maybe even a yellow dog contract they want to use for themselves injunctions where they get a court order to open the business and they can hire their scabs the people who are going to replace the ones that are on strike, you know. So, no, you don't have to know everything, but just be recognized that vocabulary. Now, what are you going to do? Clean up the cities and corruptions. Social gospel movement. That's not the gospel of wealth. I know, you know, it always gets confusing. Why do you use gospel? It's confusing me. Social gospel is more the Protestant charity, the you know, that you you help the deserving poor is very much a kind of Christian based kind of like, you know, helping out the people in the city. This is Jane Adams. This is early progressivism. This is, you know, her, uh, Lillian Wall, Florence Kelly. You got Jacob Reese kind of exposing the kind of, you know, the, the living conditions in New York City. This early progressive movement in here. Um, you know, people working on temperance, Francis Willard, Lysa again in here, they want to do, 
you know, clean up the cities here. Uh, and videos getting long. I meant to say I want to get back to Andrew Carnegie, the gospel of wealth. And the gospel of wealth is just, you just remember Spider-Man with great, you know, power becomes great responsibility. Man who dies wealthy, dies disgrace, give your money away. This is going to make you a good community leader. This is going to make you a kind of captain of industry. It's going to make you a better person. It will get you into heaven because, you know, that's probably not the Christian way is to accumulate all this wealth. What did you do for your wealth? Well, you know, you donated, you gave a lot away, you helped your fellow man and woman there, lies again, uh, that's around in the country, in the cities, and, and all over. Just besides just, you know, becoming king minus accumulating all this money and you know uh so that's what his kind of like prescription is to like you know to encourage and have an influence on others uh carnegie is <laughs> i told you with that homestead strike he's not an angel for sure but uh He's kind of like that model of Rachel Alger. It's like in the Scottish immigrant from rags of riches. He's the poster child of it. Government action or kind of government inaction in a way. I talked about this. The kind of the um, Penalties and Civil Service Act that kind of like, you know, that you have now on merit. You're going to, at, uh, at this time, get a job. This is after James Garfield gets, you know, assassinated. And they said, hey, we... You know, I was promised a government job, and they want to clean up the spoil system. I mentioned the Interstate Commerce Act, 1887, trying to you know get rid of rebates, publish train fares, and uh, again, it's not really going to be enforced until we get the Elkins and Hepburns Act. You get the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt on here. Not too much teeth in here into all this government inaction in a way. They have action, but very weak, very impotent. Uh, even the um, it's a good step, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, on paper what it says about breaking up monopolies, trust, and kind of business consolidations in here, it has to be looked upon, it, you know, and regulated. But it, they also use a provision in there to <laughs> break up strikes if it's interfering with the national interest in national business. So they use that against Debs, they use that against the striking... Uh, railroad workers of the Pullman Company in 1894. So that's why they had to come back with the Clayton Antitrust Act under Wilson here to kind of put some, you know, kind of support it and firm it up in, in a way. Anyway, so that's that, that kind of like their reactions to that. I, I, I know that quite a bit is a lot, but the reason why I'm just mentioning a lot, because you know a lot of this already. Don't worry about it. You can just, you know, say, oh yeah, I know this and how do I connect it? Oh, Mr. Price was making connection about like what's the reaction, like again, you know, to businesses and what did they try to do or try not to do? What were people doing? What was government doing? You always are going to see what's and then you know what's coming up is the progressive era, how they're going to be like, wait, 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 hang on a second. I think we really need to have some um you know, do some corrections here, some refereeing into this like excessive growth by companies, excessive accumulation of wealth, and what are we doing about to our fellow Americans? Monday, I'll go over, I, you know, part three, try, definitely populism does need dedicated time. Immigration, because it's not just really immigration for this time too as well. Just kind of do kind of the brief kind of like vocabulary and history on there. And maybe even get into or now that we're going to go overseas into the age of imperialism, Spanish-American War. All right. Hopefully that you're, you know, keeping up or at least that you archive this. You eventually see this and you take notes. You learn something from this. Uh, you know, and you'll look upon, dedicate your time and get to the main points. You're typing up stuff or you're writing up stuff from this. So, you know, you guys take care of all your classes.